Good evening, good morning, and welcome to the second Gender in Dialogue. My name is Tawny Broadbur. I am the UN Women Multi-Country Office for the Caribbean Representative. It is a real pleasure to be able to have these kinds of dialogues with our colleagues at the Fiji Multi-Country Office so that we are exploring common priority areas grounded in feminist analyses and anchored to normative frameworks to learn from better practices and lessons learned for, in this case, our South-South dialogue on redefining resilience. One of the objectives of these dialogues is also to continue to build stronger networks across the two regions, the Caribbean and the Pacific, recognizing commonalities as well as our differences and building on the lessons shared. And finally, this is a safe, inclusive and diverse space for dialogue, reflection and an analysis of the key issues. Our last dialogue was a fantastic start on we focused on women in leadership and decision making. We had Dame Billy Miller, as well as the current Minister of Education of the Marshall Islands. And we are so pleased to be able to continue with the collaboration with the Senator Dr. Hilda C. Heine, the former president of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Senator Heine is serving her third term as a member of parliament, what's called the Nitijela, from the consti constituency of or at all electoral district in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Senator Heine made history, becoming the first woman head of state and one of three women elected to the Nitijela. Dr. Heine previously also served as Minister of Education. I wonder if this means anything for the current Minister of Education. We also are very lucky to have with us today the Honorable Minister Purnell Charles Jr. Honorable Purnell P. Charles Jr. is the Minister of the new and dynamic Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change. He is also a two-time member of parliament, currently serving in Southeast Clarendon. Minister Charles is a former government senator and member of cabinet, where he served as minister without portfolio in the history of, in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation with responsibility for water, housing, and infrastructure. Prior to this appointment, he served as minister of state in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade with responsibility for diaspora affairs and the National Council for Coastal Zone Management, among many other areas. Minister Charles also served as Minister of State in the Ministry of National Security, where he had portfolio duties for the Department of Correctional Services, the Jamaica Combined Cadet Force, and special projects within the National Security Portfolio. He also continues to serve as the chairman of the UNESCO Youth Advisory Council. In addition, rounding up our panel, we have the first ever woman executive director of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, Ms. Elizabeth Riley. Ms. Elizabeth Riley, as I said, is the executive director at the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency. Ms. Riley has over 20 years experience in the area of disaster management at the regional and international levels in various capacities. At the operational level, she has played a leadership role in the coordination of regional responses to Hurricane Ivan in 2004, the Haiti earthquake in 2010, Tropical Storm Erica in 2015, Hurricanes Joaquin in 2015, Matthew in 2016, Irma 2017, Maria 2017, and Dorian 2019. If that doesn't show year by year what is happening as a result of the impacts of climate change, I'm not sure what will. Ms. Riley's field experience includes the leadership of the Sedema deployment teams in the aftermath of Hurricanes Irma and Dorian in 2017 and 2019. And many will remember these were five plus 
Ms. Riley is currently playing a leadership role in the coordination of the region's response as well to the COVID-19 pandemic. She has presented, written, and published technical papers in disaster management and environmental management whilst attached to Sedema. And prior to that, during her tenure at the University of the West Indies and the Ministry of Physical Development and Environment in Barbados. Ms. Riley has also lectured in disaster management at the University of the West Indies, Mona. I think that is the alma mater of both Minister Charles and myself and Kevin. She holds a master's in economics and environment and development from the, the University of Manchester in the UK, as well as geography. So it is also your alma mater, Ms. Riley, from the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica, and a master's certificate in results-based management and evaluation and information systems from the University of Laval in Quebec. I could go on and on about the achievements of this panel, and I will be able to reference a lot of what they've been able to do for our region, for SIDS and their countries and their particular regions, because I'm talking about SIDS as a region, but the Pacific and the Caribbean have many differences. And we will go from there. Now, I know that we have approximately 100 people registered, but many people are moving on Caribbean and Pacific time. However, our politicians were on time. All of our panelists were on time, and so we will continue and they will join in. And remember, there is an opportunity for you as panelists to ask questions. So I'd like to ask my colleagues. I'm not sure if the colleagues from the Fiji country office. Unfortunately, the representative is unable to be with us this morning. Many of us are juggling. I think multiple balls at this time. I'm also, my son may have to join us at one point because we are also doing that unpaid care responsibility and he's demanding to be let into this room and he may win. So in the meantime, I would like for us to just hand over briefly to the panelists. Let's, let's talk about this topic of redefining resilience. The challenge of what resilience means, especially in this COVID-19, I would love to say post-COVID-19 world, but I'm not sure that we are post-COVID-19 or will be in the next year. We are living through COVID-19. What does that mean for resilience? Especially when for a very long time, resilience was only seen to be the realm of environmental management and disaster management and the conversations around social vulnerabilities, economic vulnerabilities, were not always seen as one of resilience. So given all of your different backgrounds, we have a lawyer, um, we have an educator, and we also have a disaster management specialist. It's going to be very interesting to see how you redefine resilience personally and also professionally. The first question that I have is for all of you. And it is in the context of small island developing states. And often when we talk about small island developing states, we think about our vulnerabilities and not necessarily often the potential that also comes with being small and the flexibility that comes with being small. How do you define resilience? And I'd like to start with Senator Heine. How, how do you define resilience? Um, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Tony. Uh, can you hear me okay? Hearing you perfectly. Um, yes, all right. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you to the UN for this opportunity to uh, take part in this South South uh, dialogue. Um, as island communities, uh, we have a lot in common and uh, strengthening the net network between the Pacific and Caribbean can only bring us closer together as we share and learn from one another. So I thank you and uh, look forward to this panel. Uh, in terms of uh, the question in front of us on resilience, uh, that's a very uh, uh, important and one that uh, we talk about all the time, uh, the issue of resilience and um, 
I guess uh, commonly when we think about resilience, we're thinking about the ability to bounce back from uh, something or somewhere. Um, and so in, in, the, uh, in the case of uh, COVID-19 for ice island countries, many of us uh, closed our borders when, uh, when the uh, pandemic started. In the Marshall Islands, our borders are still closed. And so I think the ability for the country to survive um, on its own without the, you know, the benefit of um, open border um, is, is an aspect of uh, its resilience as a country uh, and something that we need to, to take a look at. And I think we're still learning about this uh, whole, uh, whole notion. Uh, we know that resilience is often explained as being able to perform well or remain well and grow through change, through challenge and uncertainty. And these are all the characteristics of uh, the pandemic. You know, we really don't know what to expect. It continues to change over time. And so our ability to, uh, to change and adapt to the situation that confront us, I think is what uh, resilience is all about. And um, um, we know that resilience is not something we were born with. It's built over time and it's, uh, as we ex it's based on the experience as we uh, interact with our unique uh, uh, environment and uh, cultures. Um, uh, being resilient of course can help us get through and overcome hardship. Uh, resilient, uh, I mean, from the, from the Pacific perspective, I would say resilient is something that needs to be considered in the context of uh, the collective, extended family, clan, community, and so on, because uh, the individual is not by, by himself or herself. She's part of a network, part of a community, part of an extended family. And so the ability of these uh, group to, uh, to, uh, to bounce back and to, uh, to do well in their community is, uh, is a reflection of, of not just the individual, but, but the culture and, uh, and the uh, environment. So we need to look at uh, resilience in the, from the lens of, uh, of the communal uh, or the community. We also have to look at issues and problems in the holistic way uh, as we move forward. Um, from the, how it affects the whole person, the whole organization, for example, or the whole country. I think um, as an analogy, we can think of resilience as a seesaw of balance or, a, uh, or of a balanced scale where negative experiences tip the scale toward bad outcomes. And, um, and positive experiences uh, tip it toward good outcomes. So it's really the function of the government to ensure that uh, there are more positive outcomes or that we experience uh, positive outcomes so that we can come out with uh, a good um, place overall. So we, we need to talk about employment opportunities or making sure that those are available, child care, um, support for, um, for the elderly. These are all things that help to uh, ensure that the community is resilient in the face of the uh, pandemic. Um, employment opportunities, I talked about that, as well as uh, housing support. There are so many uh, things that confront the family or the individual as a result of the pandemic. So the governments need to look at all of these areas and ensure that uh, there are positive uh, experiences for the individual and the family so that in the end, they come out uh, uh, stronger rather than um, being in a negative way. Uh, in, the, in the Marshall Islands, uh, and this is my last point, um, we have uh, launched just recently a um, $1 million women's business uh, loan fund uh, with support from the government of Taiwan to help women start own businesses to help their families. Uh, and these are the kinds of uh, 
a positive outcome that I think uh, countries and communities need to think about in order to uh, build back better and ensure women are able to cope or to improve their own economic situation. Um, so I guess uh, looking at education is also another, another initiative that has to be in place to ensure that women and families can uh, come out uh, at the other end of the situation of the pandemic, uh, able to uh, take care of their difficult situation. Um, so I'll stop there. I'm sure there are other uh, uh, thoughts to add to the definition of resilient, but those are just some, some thoughts uh, to share. Thank you. Thank you so much. And those are such critical thoughts in terms of the care economy, in terms of the economic empowerment, the fact that resilience looks a little different when we're talking about COVID-19 as well. Minister Charles, what are your thoughts on, on this context of SIDS, our constantly dynamic reality with regards to now COVID-19 and natural hazards? How would you define resilience? Firstly, let me just say thank you, um, Tony. Um, and I want to just acknowledge all of the distinguished ladies that I have the opportunity to be on this panel with. I feel very, very lucky and blessed today um, to be able to share this perspective. Um, I will firstly adopt all that the former president has said because she gave a brilliant perspective which really touches on the need for resilience to be defined in a multi-sectoral or from a multi-sectoral lens. Um, I just add to that, that you know, resilience must mean for us as small island developing states, the creation of a framework um, and vehicles that take into consideration our unique circumstances, our unique vulnerabilities, um, our limitations um, and the need for us to make good use uh, of, of what we have. We don't have the latitude that other countries may have. So we have to, to be very efficient. Resilience means improving efficiency. It means creating that enabling framework for the private and public sector to, to drive towards efficiency. It means advancing sustainable projects um, that will make our investment with the limited funds that we have be maximized. It means integrating sustainable practices into everything that we do. Um, as was said by, by Senator, all aspects from, from agriculture to other ministries must have integrated into them sustainable practices. That is the definition of building resilience in my view, and I would say also using innovation and um, you know technology to to make things stronger, building our capacity. I, I, I'll, I'll make one point. This morning, my ministry we launched the National Spatial Planning Information Technology Platform, which is going to allow for us in Jamaica to to utilize data across sectors in a more integrated um, and defined way so that our decisions that we make, the policies that we craft, and consequently the outcomes that we achieve um, are based on science and technology that is accurate. That is resilience. You know, the integration of those tools um, and the introduction of those kinds of, of ac activities and projects and programs, that is resilience to me, um, particularly because, again, in the Caribbean region, we're not talking about climate change. We're living it. Dominica was wiped out. Um, Jamaica, we got some torrential rain two weeks ago, and... I'm telling you, it, it, it was like the River Nile running through the middle of the country. So resilience means redefining our thinking, redefining our practices, um, and strengthening 
how we operate across sectors, across communities, across the whole of society to advance um, a stronger, more sustainable approach. That's my perspective. Thank you so much for that, Minister Charles. And thank you as well for always being an advocate and ally for gender equality and women's empowerment. From economic empowerment to climate change and resilience more broadly, you always step up to the plate and we really appreciate your support you. and partnership. Ms. Riley, what are your thoughts uh, from Sedima on how you would define resilience? Thank you very much and good evening, Tony, and good evening to my fellow panelists. Thank you very much to UN Women for inviting Sedima to be a part of this very important conversation this afternoon. So my fellow panelists have alluded to the unique vulnerability of small island developing states. And this is a very important starting point in discussing what resilience means in the context of SIDS. From a disaster management perspective, we do know that we live in a very complex multi-hazard environment. And this has been borne out certainly within the states of the Car Caribbean in recent years. And I would say, particularly most recently, where we have had hazards of protracted duration in the form of COVID-19, and that has been layered upon an already complex environment, as we've seen with the hurricane season, as well as the recent volcanic eruption in St. Vincent. And we know, as the Honorable Minister has indicated that climate change is happening. It's no longer a future conversation. And certainly the State of the Caribbean Climate Report, which was published in 2020, bears this out, where it confirms that all of our climate parameters are in fact already changing, um, with sea level rise expected to reach or exceed a meter by the end of the century. Our air and sea surface temperatures are already trending upwards. And we know that the suggestion is that our region will be 17% drier by the end of the century with an 80% increase in category four and category five systems up to the end of the century. So it, it really is a very complex environment. So within that context, the SEDEMA coordinating unit and our regional partners have looked at resilience, yes, from the context of bouncing back, but we take it a bit further to talk about bouncing forward. In other words, how do we put ourselves in a position that is even better than our original starting point before the hazard impact? And in 2017, in the aftermath of hurricanes Irma and Maria, in fact, the heads of government of CARICOM charged Sedima and asked the question, what does resilience really mean? within the context of the CARICOM small island states. And so we work consultatively with partners and we've articulated five critical pillars that must be features of resilience building. And the first is related to social protection for the marginal and most vulnerable. And of course, within this category, we look within the context of women and girls. And as we know, COVID-19 has changed the socioeconomic profile of our CARICOM states. In fact, a 2020 IDB report um, entitled COVID-19, the Caribbean crisis, um, indicates that during the first six weeks of the pandemic alone, households with incomes below the minimum wage more than doubled in the Caribbean, specifically increasing from 19.9% in January of 2020 to 45.5% in April of 2020. So the social protection, absolutely critical. The second area, in our definition is related to the issue of physical infrastructure. And we have found within the Caribbean context that with every hazard impact, the losses with damage and losses with respect to physical infrastructure have been incredibly significant. So the hardening of physical infrastructure must be a feature. The third area is around economic opportunities. And we really want to look at economic opportunities at multiple levels and also for multiple groups, including for women and girls. And uh, the fourth area is about environmental protection because there's a very intricate relationship between 
disaster risk conversations and environmental protection. And the, it goes both ways where when we um, diminish the integrity of our environment, it contributes to disaster risk and we, by impacts of hazards also has an implication for um, environment, the environment and protection of the environment as well. And finally, but certainly not in any way diminished, is the pillar related to operational readiness and recovery. And from our perspective, as, in as much as we are making efforts to look at disaster mitigation interventions, which are closely aligned with climate change adaptation interventions, we do realize by virtue of the area, the region that we live in and the high levels of vulnerability that we do have to position ourselves to adequately respond to hazard impacts. So operational readiness is always going to be a part of it. And of course, recovery, because recovery is really about the opportunity for integrating resilience considerations so that we don't just bounce back, but we bounce forward. Thank you. Love that. I like the bounce forward. We've been talking about building back equal, yes. but I like the bounce forward equal um, because a lot of what we've been seeing from COVID-19 and any other hazard that has affected the Caribbean or the Pacific is that already existing inequalities are further exploited. And although many Caribbean states and Pacific states are considered middle income and some even high income, that statistic that you gave about how quickly the number of families living below the poverty line shifted in the, in the aftermath of the onset of COVID-19 is demonstrative of the fact that the multiple vulnerabilities that all of you have spoken to mean that we cannot always or only use GDP as a real estimate exactly. of resilience, because often it is used as, as a, a measure of resilience as well, not only success, but also resilience. Now, Senator Heine, you've always been a champion for gender equality and climate change. And throughout your presidency, there was the Micronesian Women's Conference. I actually still have a, a t-shirt from a meeting I went to in FSM many years ago. Um, and RMI has always been a leader at the climate summits, whether it is youth activists or parliamentarians and politicians. Consistent, the, consistently, the Marshall Islands have been a first mover, also being the first nation to release, and you can tell me if I'm saying this correctly, Tile Tilo, the Lighting the Way Climate Strategy 2015, that long-term climate change strategy. Often when we talk about these kinds of strategies, we don't necessarily center gender equality or women's empowerment. What does a gender responsive approach to recovery look like? And, and yes, we're speaking more specific to COVID-19 recovery, but it could, any, it could really be any kind of recovery. Why is it critical in order for small island developing states to let's, let's take on what Ms. Riley shared about bounce forward equal, to bounce forward better and equal. And why for small island developing states in particular is a gender lens and a feminist approach critical to bouncing forward equal? Uh, thank you. Uh, I also like the uh, notion of uh, bouncing forward. And uh, when we talk about uh, building back better, it's about um, not about doing business as usual, uh, which would uh, just uh, not put us uh, going forward, but it'll be uh, making us remaining in the same place. Uh, we cannot expect different results if we're doing the same thing all over again. So uh, this is uh, the pandemic, uh, as well as climate change and all the disasters uh, that have uh, affected the, the small island countries are giving us opportunities to look at how we do things and uh, to be more ambitious in what we do as we plan and looking forward. And that's what the Marshall Islands has been. We are a small, small country, uh, but we've been very ambitious about our plans, uh, trying to advocate for for what's 
possible out there. Some people are telling us that we're maybe a little bit crazy because uh, we're, we don't have the resources and uh, we cannot do what we're dreaming about doing. But you cannot uh, achieve anything if you do not dream. And so I think this is part of the, um, uh, the ingredients for uh, bouncing forward is to look ahead and, uh, and dream the impossible. Um, we have to uh, adopt different approaches to uh, tackle recovery, and uh, some of which uh, uh, Ms. Riley talked about. You know, so a lot of these things are, are necessary for us to, uh, to overcome the context that we're, uh, we find ourselves in. Um, for SIDS in particular, the application of a gender lens is critical for building that better because our special case uh, means that even before COVID-19, we were already challenged with inequalities that have now been uh, exasperated by, by the current situation. And so as government, governments and as development partners, we need to be more aggressive uh, in addressing um, our gender concerns. Otherwise, we will still have unfinished business uh, come 2030 when the, uh, 20, the SDGs are supposed to be uh, uh, achieved. Um, the socioeconomic impact of the Pacific has been significant with uh, closing of international uh, borders, the loss of tourism and associated uh, industries and uh, economic downturn that is impacting jobs and businesses, we are all familiar with these things. Uh, small and medium businesses and the informal economy where women are concentrated have been significantly impacted. So putting a gender lens on, um, on efforts to build back provides an opportunity to improve on the situation before COVID, to promote gender equality and to address these inequalities. Uh, small island developing state governments must, must address these issues to ensure a robust recovery. They must take gender sensitive measures to directly address the specific risk or the specific risks and challenges that women and girls uh, face as a result of the pandemic. Uh, some of these look uh, are like work to respond and prevent violence against women. That needs to take place. Put in place policies that recognize and support unpaid care work, uh, protect women's economic security and employment. And my example about the, um, about the women's fund is an example of, uh, you know, really helping uh, women uh, improve their economic situation. Uh, and, and also to ensure women's participation in uh, COVID related task force and uh, activities like that. Government must also uh, make sure that they support um, things like uh, making sure the loans and business advice are available to women and businesses, uh, making sure that uh, they support payments uh, or that uh, social support like payments reach uh, female headed households. Uh, also that they support um, Domestic violence services uh, improve uh, safe houses for women, making sure that those are available for uh, women that are uh, affected by, by domestic violence, which as the research shown, it's increased during the pandemic. So women are uh, affected by all of these things and uh, it, the government needs to take a look at how they respond to, uh, to the needs of women. Um, during this situation. I'll stop there and uh, Thank you so let much. the others Everything. share. Thank you so much. Everything that you've touched on also, we were seeing across the globe, what they're calling the shadow pandemic of violence against women and girls. However, mm -hmm. it's been with us for a very long time. So mm -hmm. what COVID-19 has really laid bare a pandemic that already existed. If the data in both the Pacific and the Caribbean demonstrate numbers that should not exist in the beautiful islands that we inhabit. The unpaid care work, 
responsibilities and burdens, women's participation, access to finance and resources, social protection. We're not gonna be able to bounce forward without 50% of the population having the support they need to fully engage. Minister Charles, given SID's vulnerability to climate change and the gender inequality of risk in particular, why is it important that a gender lens is used in climate resilient urban planning and renewal? What is being done in Jamaica that you think could be a better practice across all SIDS? Uh, that's really a massive question. That question could, could really um, form the substance of an entire discussion. And a lot of it was also touched on um, in the response a while ago from, from Senator, former president. Uh, the, in the face of what we see occurring now, the hurricanes, floods, tropical storms, droughts, the most vulnerable um, are our women and children, particularly those that are in the lower socioeconomic strata. Um, and th that grouping is being increasingly affected in several different ways. Uh, PAHO recently noted uh, that it, it, our women play a critical role in terms of disaster mitigation um, and the response efforts whether they're acting in their traditional gender role as, as, as has been seen in terms of the domestic responsibilities that fall on their shoulders or whether they've transcended that. Regardless, all women play a critical role. And that is why gender must form, must be incorporated rather into any project planning cycle. Um, and this, this is the only way for us to guarantee success in terms of addressing the issues effectively um, for climate change and disaster management. So we know that women are overrepresented in particular areas. Um, small farming, women are overrepresented in those areas in our agriculture industry. They are disproportionately represented in the informal economy, in underpaid jobs with little security uh, and no benefits such as healthcare and union representation. So the, the informal and agricultural sectors are also the sectors that happen to be most impacted by natural disasters. And so if you have our women being overrepresented in those areas that are most vulnerable to natural disasters, then you, it is consequent that women therefore become um, you know, most vulnerable of all the sectors. The, the gender implications are also revealed and exposed in terms um, of implications of labor when it relates also to housing. You know, my ministry includes housing, urban renewal, environment, and climate change. And when we do our analysis on housing and access to safe, legal, and affordable housing, um, we see that there are vulnerabilities as it relates to both urban and rural areas where particularly female-headed households, Tony, there are inadequacies in terms of provision um, of housing solutions for those, for those females that are running the household alone. Um, and we have a serious issue in Jamaica in terms of, of informal settlements and squatting. Um, and we also link that to the capacity for men to migrate as opposed to women. Um, and, and that has a lot to do with the burden women carry inherently. Um, where we have our informal settlements, we also note that those are the areas where you have the female-headed households, where you also have the greatest vulnerability to those, those solutions being destroyed during a natural disaster. So many families are forced to relocate after you have a, a, a disaster um, and you have inadequate facilities in terms of just carrying out simple tasks like cooking. <laughs> and who does, who does all of that end up falling on? A lot of times, most of the times, it is the woman that has a domestic burden um, and it increases in terms of economic burden 
leaving her with less capacity to, to be mobile and agile and to go and find alternative sources of income because the women are primarily responsible for the duties such as child care and, and, and even care for the elderly or disabled. Um, so they don't have the liberty to move around as, as, as men may. Coupled with what I heard Senator say that um, take COVID-19 and the impact of the restriction of our movement. And we know that the WHO has already come out with a report titled Violence and Disasters. And, if you, and I, I would encourage colleagues to read it because it notes that women who were living in a violent relationship before the disaster uh, or before disasters experience increased violence post disaster. Um, and, you know, they may be separated from family, friends and other support systems. And so you find that, you know, the, the measure of protection that they would have has reduced, as well as in COVID-19, where we saw a very unique situation where people had to be stopped in one place and you were forced to stay in one place. And that had impacts on, on how you, um, you know, how you were operating and and you know, just mentally, the stress on, on males and females, we see where it has led to an increase um, in violence. So, you know, it is very important for us to not run away from the reality. And I find that sometimes we have a tendency, tendency to say, well, you know, when we're talking gender, it has to be men and women. I'm a man. So, of course, I understand that gender is defined in that way. But the reality is that there are some very obvious and clear issues that weigh heavily towards um, the vulnerability um, of, of, of the circumstances that women are placed, placed in. Not that they are vulnerable, that they are you know, not vulnerable, that they can't um, address issues, but the inherent, the natural circumstances don't present um, a level playing field in that regard. Um, I'll go further to say, you know, a part of what we're doing in Jamaica is to advance plans that respect the reality. Uh, we have community-based disaster preparedness and response plans that take into account, um, you know, our women and just the psychological, social and economic vulnerabilities um, so that we can help to reduce the susceptibility to disasters. We have a project that is entitled Facilitating a Gender Responsive Approach to Climate Change Adaptation and Mitigation in Jamaica. And that's very important to us as a government. Um, the project was launched earlier this year um, and it really laid the groundwork for normalizing climate and gender consideration in all of our policies and programs, um, making our approach in the country to disaster risk reduction and development planning more strategic and I dare say even more effective because we're not running away from the reality. We know that climate change has a greater impact on particular sections of our uh, population in all countries, not just in the small island developed states. Um, those areas where we are more reliant on natural resources, clearly you're going to have more vulnerability there. And it so happens that a lot of those areas um, have are, are filled with, with our women uh, in terms of their labor. I just want to address also, uh, you've asked in, in the broad question um, about what we're doing. We have gender focal points in all of our ministry. The board that advises me um, is uh, gender balanced. I know, Miss Riley, you'll be very proud to, to know that I have 50% men and 50% women on my climate change advisory board. Um, and I thought that it is very important for us to have that. Um, so people could, could understand that we're not just speaking about it, but we are practical in advancing that gender balance. At a national level, we have Vision 2030, which takes into consideration a lot of these issues. We have the enabling gender responsive disaster recovery, climate and environmental resilience program. It's a very long name, 
but the, the acronym is Engender, which really is a synergy between my ministry and the ministry that, that has responsibility for gender, led by Honorable Babsy Grange. Um, and there's several other things. Um, let me just close off by addressing quickly the issue relating to what we can improve. Um, an assessment was, if an assessment is done, and, and some have been done um, by my climate change division years before I got into this position. And the assessment found, Tony, that Jamaica's institutional and policy framework for gender and climate change development was disjointed, right? With little or no integration in relation to gender. Specifically, um, the Climate Change Division and the Bureau of Gender Affairs, two different ministries. Um, so at the, at the time, it was in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation and the Bureau of Gender Affairs is in a different ministry. So they're guided by separate policies um, and we found that while the climate change policy framework does articulate the need for gender equitable development in line with our national uh, vision, um, there are still limitations in terms of the actions that are necessary to fully integrate gender considerations. Uh, and and some, similarly, I'd say, um, Senator, the national policy that we have in Jamaica for gender equality could also benefit from the inclusion of climate change considerations. So I would, I would say if there's anything that we um, could think of in terms of doing better, and, and I dare say we're doing a lot, um, mm -hmm. but I think we could, we could do better do in terms of the integration of our policies on both sides. Um, and making sure that as we speak about full integration of these of this gender lens, that it occurs in every single ministry of government. Agreed. And I think one of the areas you've noted that Jamaica is doing a good job on, a uh, very good job on, is representation. 50-50 on the board that advises you. And that informs very well the next question for Ms. Riley, because we're talking about policy implementation, of course, but we're also talking about who informs that policy. Ms. Riley, how can we ensure that women and girls are better able to contribute to and benefit from climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies and innovations? Thank you so much for that question, Tony. And my answer is simple. We, we have to be deliberate about it and we have to take action. But I break it down into five specific things that I think are required. I think we are on the way in a number of these areas, but th this is my perspective on what's required. I, I think first it is really about our guiding frameworks. And within the disaster management space under the Regional Comprehensive Disaster Management Strategy, which has been adopted by all 19 of the Sedema participating states, gender is identified as a cross-cutting theme, um, which supports all of the results area, result areas of that strategy. And, the regional strategy is informed and guided by global level agreements uh, at the international level. So including the Beijing Platform for Action, CEDAW, the Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals. But we also have a suite of regional gender agreements which the CDM strategy seeks to support in implementation. So we have the CARICOM Gender Plan of Action, the CARICOM Regional Programming Framework 20, 2005 to 2015. So the, the point that I'm making is that we have to be very deliberate at the regional level in our articulation of the intent. So the next point is related to how then do we move that intent into action? 
So my second point is really about creating spaces for engagement of women and girls. And this has to do with the issue of governance. And I want to, of course, congratulate the Honorable Minister because I, I was very intrigued to hear the types of actions that are being undertaken in Jamaica. And I think this is what we need across our CARICOM space. The, the, the interventions have to be very deliberate and purposeful. So with, with governance, what we're talking about is really providing those opportunities for the voices to come to the table to inform um, the integration into uh, climate change adaptation and other types of measures. My third point is res with respect to how do we treat the issue of access? Because we want to get women and girls more involved, but they have to be able to access the opportunities that are made available through the spaces of engagement. And this is really about strengthening capacity. Uh, strengthening capacity to be able to access resources, strengthening capacity to be able to effectively implement uh, resources as well. And fourthly, I think it's about within the projects being very clear with respect to beneficiaries and target beneficiaries. So if we're discussing having women and girls actively um, being involved, we have to identify them as specific beneficiaries in the interventions that we're undertaking so that we're able to do the appropriate level of measurement. And that's my final point, the, the area of measurement and how we are leveraging the opportunities for monitoring and evaluation, how we are ensuring that we have appropriate and measurable gender indicators and monitoring and evaluation frameworks and ensuring also that we report on those. Thank you. Thank you so much. The role of gender statistics, the role of reliable data is so critical for us to understand what evidence-based policy needs to be, what evidence-based programming needs to be and how we can measure progress. As Minister Charles was saying, Often, and, and this is something in the, the WHO report, it's also in uh, the UN Women's Status of Women and Men report, a summary report on the COVID-19 pandemic, where women were before was challenging. And as a result, what happened with a protracted crisis like COVID-19 has meant economically, socially, it has been very difficult for them to bounce back or build back in any, any way or forward. And so that program that Senator Heine spoke of that the government of the Marshall Islands has now implemented with regards to economic empowerment, a million dollar program for economic empowerment is, is extremely important, especially since as Minister Charles indicated, we need to be thinking as well of the children who are in the houses, and many of these houses are single parent households. Now, Senator Heine, we know that governments rely on women and young women in particular, but actually I wouldn't only say young women, I would say also elderly women's unpaid care work, because in the Caribbean, we see a lot of elderly parents. I remember after Hurricane Maria going to Dominica and seeing older women, grandmothers, with at least five children that they were taking care of because their children had migrated to be able to make money to send back. And so some of them were still in shelters taking care of multiple grandchildren. So we know that governments, communities, society rely on women's unpaid care work. And it's often unrecognized. I think it wasn't recognized until all of us had to stay home and realize somebody has to cook clean, take care of the children, help them go to school. Given the small economies of small island developing states, what measures do you think we can put into place to ensure that small island developing states can deliver solutions for the care economy? This would include adequate care for children, adequate care for the elderly. These are things you spoke of in your first response as well as those with chronic illnesses, people living with disabilities. I see one of our, our participants has shared 
what resilience is for her as a person living with disabilities in the Marshall Islands. And that it means she doesn't have to rely on people to get her where she wants to go. And that's what resilience is for her. But for you, just asking your thoughts on this, what can governments do, especially small island developing states governments with tight fiscal spaces while supporting and recognizing women's contribution? Um, thank you. Uh, before I uh, speak to your question, I want to acknowledge uh, some of the points that came across from uh, our two other panelists uh, from the minister. I appreciate the uh, thought that or the um, point that you have uh, gender focal points in each of your ministries so that there is a coordinated effort to look at gender issues across. And I think um, uh, that's that's crucial because uh, we tend to isolate uh, the issues of women, at least in some governments I know. Uh, the women's office is over here and uh, it's just there. And uh, it's not uh, necessarily uh, issues and financing and all that are not integrated across uh, government sectors. And I hear uh, Ms. Riley talking about the, uh, the notion of integration and, uh, and uh, not doing things in silos. And I, and I think uh, we need to address that because many of us have plans. We have laws that look at gender issues and, um, but they're not being implemented uh, fully or across uh, uh, the governments. Uh, we talk about um, streamlining uh, these issues of uh, gender issues uh, uh, across government, but it's not really happening in many places. Uh, and I think these are areas that um, uh, as we look towards uh, bouncing forward, we need to look at these because women are critical to the, to the, uh, to the recovery of any government, any country. Um, we mentioned that we, we comprise more than 50% of the population. So if we're all uh, doing what we need to do, to support our uh, development, uh, you know, uh, we can do so much more. But the supports need to be there, and uh, and, uh, and 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 need to be real. It's not just in papers and plans and talks, but uh, needs to be genuine. Where the monies uh, need to be allocated to make sure that um, gender issues are taken care of. So the the whole issue on. Um, unpaid care uh, is really women issue right now. We are the ones doing all the, uh, the bulk of the unpaid um, work in, in our communities. And uh, we've seen that the uh, pandemic has exasperated this, uh, uh, this burden on women to do this uh, uh, unpaid care uh, because uh, schools have closed and so it's on the women to take care of uh, children. Uh, workplaces uh, lockdown have also increased uh, 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 women's uh, work in the home. In, in the home. Um, uh, when their uh, families are ill, especially with pandemic, uh, I'm so uh, grateful that in the Marshall Islands we haven't had uh, COVID-19. So we're not, we haven't had to deal with this uh, uh, issue, but I'm sure that in countries uh, in the Pacific, uh, Fiji and uh, and PNG and other countries are experiencing this. And uh, the number of uh, ill uh, family members, I'm sure is, is uh, exponentially uh, increased the number or the uh, burden on unpaid care by women. Um, so we, you know, we need to take a look at this. Uh, we've been advocating for increasing social protection measures for women and young girls. Uh, and that is, um, an ongoing piece of policy advocacy that uh, we continue to do. A, lot, a number of our organizations are doing that across the region. Uh, in addition to that, I think we need to be thinking outside the box on what else can be done. Uh, certainly our economies are small uh, and they cannot afford uh, sophisticated uh, social welfare uh, programs. But perhaps if we need to be doing things differently, the question is what have we learned in the last 25 years after Beijing and all those uh, documents that we're uh, having to respond to. 
I mentioned before the need to look at a different funding uh, uh, and financing model where we should be advocating for more integrated model as uh, brought up by other uh, panel members. We need to uh, promote gender mainstreaming. Again, we discussed that earlier. Um, we cannot continue to advocate for mainstreaming gender and then continue to fund programs in silos, as I mentioned earlier. That continues to be overwhelmingly the, the status quo or the way things are done. It is, on, it is the only way we can truly mobilize a whole of government and multi-sectoral approach to gender issues, including in the, in the care economy. We need to mainstream uh, our activities and our responses. Uh, there is a need to recognize also and adopt measures to reduce, redistribute, and value the disproportionate share of unpaid care and domestic work that women do by promoting the equal sharing of responsibilities between women and men within the household. Now, we probably cannot uh, mandate that by law, but this is something that we need to advocate. We need to make sure that the notion is out there and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's convincing. We try to convince our men folks to, to step up and share, the, share the, uh, the burden of the household work. Um, and I know that things are improving, but we need more, we need to do more. Um, so so what, what uh, can we put in place? You know, they, those are some ideas and some issues, but um, we need to share, and as I mentioned earlier, unpaid work equally. Uh, and so this involves uh, shifting gender norms and encouraging men to partake in household jobs. I mentioned that earlier. Um, we also need to reduce household labor by creating sustainable infrastructure, uh, you know, water, electricity, uh, sanitation, all of these things need to be in place so that women don't carry the burden of doing more. We need, if there is no running water, women, have the extra burden of uh, bringing water from uh, fire or bringing fire wood, uh, woods to cook for the family or to clean. So these infrastructure need to be there uh, so that uh, the burden of uh, unpaid work can be lessened. Um, we need to uh, invest in public care services. Uh, we also need to measure unpaid care. And you know, you mentioned uh, statistics. Yeah, if we don't, if we don't measure something, we won't, we won't deal with it. We have to measure uh, issues uh, in unpaid care. We need to know exactly how much is going, you know, or, or how much uh, women are uh, doing in this area. Uh, some research is saying that two to ten percent of unpaid work is done by uh, more so than women. I mean, than men. It's done by women. So. There are uh, these statistics that need to be collected and they need to be current with respect to the unpaid care uh, uh, area. Uh, we talk about, I think somebody mentioned uh, parental uh, leave, you know, uh, take a look again at uh, parental leave for, uh, for mother and father. Uh, how do we uh, um, improve our laws so that uh, there is parity there are uh, paid leave for women if they have to stay home to take care of their kids. Uh, there are many other uh, areas that we should be looking at. Uh, uh, we mentioned earlier the notion of creating safe places for abused women and girls. Uh, and we mentioned also the uh, notion of promoting women's equal participation and economic empowerment. Um, these are all, uh, I think, uh, opportunities and areas that could uh, greatly improve uh, the situation for women and especially the unpaid uh, work that women uh, um, are yeah, I, responsible is... for and carry the burden for. So I guess I'll, I'll stop there. I, you know, I'm not sure if I addressed the question, but uh, those are some uh, ideas Absolutely. I wanted to share. Did.
<laughs> you absolutely addressed the question. And one of the things that's quite clear is how all of what you're sharing is integrated. When you were speaking, I was also thinking about what Minister Charles was saying about resilience being efficiency. And you were talking about certain things, making sure that they're moving a certain way in terms of the silos being broken. And we know when it comes to reporting on the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, everybody only looks to the gender bureau, not thinking exactly. that every single part of government has a role to play in the report. They can't do it alone. Also, what kind of resources, both financial and human, are given to the gender bureau to do the kind of work we're asking them to do when it comes to breaking down those silos. And then of course, the unpaid care burden that really looking at social protection in a thorough way. When I know many parents, when they heard we had to go to work, but there was no school, really sat and thought, how am I going to do this? Especially parents in lower socioeconomic classes that are not able to afford someone to assist them with the care of their children or doesn't have a family member living in the house. You know, it really, we need to figure out a way to not expect the work to be done without acknowledgement or measurement. And as you said, often in our world, if we don't measure it, it doesn't exist. Now we want to be able to open up so that the participants who are already quite active can ask questions of the panelists. So participants, Please put your questions into the question and answer chat. Thank you so much for all of you who have already been quite active on our chat. While you're putting your other questions, I see one which I will get to and there. Please put other questions in as well. Minister Charles and Ms. Riley, between the two of you, one of the things that is a bit of the elephant in the room is the fact that most of our economies are heavily reliant on tourism. And we know that about 60%, at least in Jamaica, those persons who are in the tourism industry and the jobs that were most cut were also women. What should bouncing forward equal? Ms. Riley, we have completely taken over <laughs> your bouncing forward um, um, analogy. But what should it look like for small island developing states that are reliant on tourism? Hey, Tony, did you want me to go first? Please, Please. go ahead, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. The so minister, much. the last word. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And, and the bouncing forward slogan is for free use, absolutely. We want to promote that. So on this question of, um, of tourism, and, uh, you know, COVID-19 has really exposed the... What well, we always knew that tourism is a vulnerable sector and uh, it has also exposed the reality of the limited diversification of the economies within our CARICOM states. So I think I think one of the things we have to recognize is that you know where are women really positioned within the tourism sector um, in the region and if you look across the uh, territories and, and the statistics of where the women are placed, we note that for the most part, we tend to see women in the lower level occupations um, linked very much to the service delivery within the industry. And uh, in uh, many cases, there may be limited opportunities with respect to sort of future growth within the tourism sector and being able to move, move up. Um, so the reality has been that those are the persons who would of course be the first to be laid off. Um, and even in situations where the industry is uh, vibrant and operational, there's also the reality of seasonal work. And that has its own complications in terms of contributing to the vulnerability of women who are employed in the sector. So I wanted to suggest two things. One is related to, and this is particularly within the COVID-19 context, because I think 
COVID-19 is offering us an opportunity to really think differently about the workplace and to think differently about what, what kind of support is required within the workplace. And if you're thinking about the facilitation of females who are heavily un involved in unpaid care, particularly for, for children, and this you raised earlier, Tony, in the discussion when we were talking about, you know, you're called back out to work, but the children are not at school and you know in a in the tourism sector context what then does a, a single mother do and uh, I, I have to say even from a, a personal perspective that I had to work on this matter myself having children of my own and having to work uh, whilst the children were at home having to be supervised and and I had a challenge in time with it and I can't imagine challenges that other persons would have had with it so the, the first point is really about thinking differently about the workplace and what kind of facilitation could be provided within the context of the workplace, especially given the reality that COVID-19 is, we, we, we have to live with COVID-19 and the time horizon on COVID-19 is, is not clear. And even as we take efforts now within the region to regenerate the tourism industry. I think this is something that has to be a very real part of the conversation and how um, companies, entities within the tourism sector can really look to think differently about this and facilitate uh, women who have that responsibility for unpaid care of children. The, the second area is really about, it, it's about that vulnerability and you know, if with, with limited skill sets, um, what are options when those avenues or doors for employment are closing because of the vulnerability of the tourism sector? And I think a number of the countries in the region have already started on the path and not just thinking about, but putting opportunities out there for reskilling and for retooling of women to be able to uh, seek out and gain employment in other areas. So those are two of the thoughts that I have on it. And of course, very much looking forward to hearing the perspectives of the Honorable Minister on this point as well. Minister, over to you. Well, I, I must tell you, you know, Ms. Riley is brilliant. I could literally say ditto uh, because the, the points are just cogent. Um, they really reflect the understanding of the issues that we're facing. I, I think we will have to use the challenges that we have faced in this pandemic to, uh, to really reset our thinking, reset our operation, to acknowledge the reality of how fragile our economies are and the need for diversification. This is no longer theory. This is, this is what we have, this is a necessity it's not something we are doing in school as a paper anymore. This, this is a pandemic that has hit us um, and really should be used as just a, 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 a time to pivot and reset how we do things. I mean, when you speak about the Caribbean and small island developing states across the world, not just the Caribbean, being tourism reliant, um, we are because we are among the most attractive countries. But, you know, when you're small, you're beautiful. You're a diamond. You're a gem. Um, and it is the same unique characteristics that make you so attractive that also make you attractive to several natural disasters. We are your position in, in the middle of water. So you, it's wonderful to be around, you know, to be completely surrounded by the Caribbean Sea. But it also means that you are directly in the path of hurricanes. And so being tourism reliant means that we have to build resilience in the tourism sector. Um, I won't repeat what, what Elizabeth has already um, articulated, but I will add, add to it uh, by saying that we have to recognize the need uh, to, to really to strengthen our ecosystem preservation because our tourist industry um, is very reliant on our natural environment. P 
people will fly to Barbados because of the beautiful beaches. So if climate change um, affects whether you have a beach or not, people will no longer want to fly to Barbados for the beautiful beaches if they're not there. Um, people will fly to Jamaica to, to see Duns River Fall and the Black River area and all of these areas which are natural um, you know, parts of our ecology. And so we have to have that balance as we reset our thinking, um, Tony, towards ecological and economic advancement. And, and a lot of that will impact our tourism industry. Um, you know, take for example, the protection of our coral reefs and mangrove forests, which help to buffer our shoreline against the impacts of waves that take away our sand and, and um, erode our beaches. Um, these things impact our hotels as well. So if you don't have that natural environment, um, then you won't have a healthy tourism sector. From the perspective of, of, of how our women um, and men are impacted. Um, I'd say that a lot of what was, was said in terms of the need for strengthening resilience um, is, is relevant also from a gender perspective. If you look on the, the, the spectrum of, of jobs that are interacting in the tourism sector, you're gonna see um, chefs, you'll see hotel operators, tour guides, farmers, um, you see those ladies that are outside selling craft. Um, you see the restauranteurs, you see waiters. Um, in, in large part, what we're saying is that a lot of these jobs that have been impacted are jobs that are um, specific to our women, our women uh, particularly those who have the burden, as I said before, the responsibility of childcare, elderly care, and sometimes themselves um, taking care of the entire household. So this really highlights the critical importance of protecting the tourism industry by building resilience, by advancing, um, you know, from my perspective, the strengthening of our, of our environmental agenda as well. And, and forgive me, uh, I can't help because of the, 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 the nature of my ministry to bring up the environmental considerations, which I think are also very critical in the discussion that we're having today. We have a tree planting initiative in Jamaica, for instance, 3 million trees in three years, which is going to help the tourism industry. And I'm sure if we were to do an analysis, you'll see that you have more women involved in it than men. Um, that's just the reality. So my, my final comments are, are just that in this period, um, as we hopefully, I am praying that we are moving out of COVID-19 and there will be no um, you know, resurgence. Um, and we speak that out. Um, as we move to post-COVID-19, we have to make significant adjustments to our lifestyle and to our livelihoods. Um, and in a similar manner, we must consider the lessons from this new paradigm and we have to apply it, not just, no, not, not just consider them and then we have it in theory. We must apply it to in, ensuring that we are increasing our climate resilience. Sometimes, um, Senator Heine, we, we speak a lot, but we don't do enough. And I know that as, as you, a former president, um, I can imagine how broad your back and shoulders have had to be to reach to where you are. Um, and I would just echo the sentiments that you have articulated and, and Ms. Riley and Tony in saying that we, we want effective development and to have effective de development, it must include the needs and the potential contributions of our women and our men. And I'm gonna leave it there. Absolutely. UN Women had a campaign started under one of our previous um, regional program directors, Roberta Clark, called Share the Care, engaging men and yeah. boys to figure out how we share care and something that we brought back up last year as well for that. And I think, thank you so much for that. We have 10 minutes, three questions. 
And those answers on tourism are critical. And one thing I think Jamaica has been able to teach the region, and this may be a result of what happened in Jamaica in the 70s when tourism wasn't as robust as it had been, is Jamaica has always been a place that made sure that the tourism product was also available to locals. And I think I'm now seeing across the Caribbean, everybody has staycation deals, local deals. And that's something that didn't always happen before across the Caribbean so that you know your main market is your local market. So we have three questions. One is from Deepti Karan Weiss, who's thanking the panelists and a warm, giving us all a warm Pacific greetings. We really do miss you in the Pacific. The Caribbean and the Pacific are so similar. And she wants to know how we can ensure persons with disabilities and older persons are also at the center when we speak about those who are most vulnerable. I'm going to give you the three questions and then you can answer whichever one you feel is most relevant to, to you. The next question comes from Reverend Vonnie James from Grenada, wanting to know that for SIDS, especially in the Caribbean, where religion plays an important role and most of the adherents are women, what kind of conversation is happening there concerning resilience and women's empowerment? And then the last question is from Cynthia Williams, who asks, while we know that integration of gender is critical to the advancement and development of small island developing states, it continues to be something extremely difficult to achieve. Political will within the various levels of government is so important to these efforts. What are some concrete actions that can be taken to gain political will and ensure that gen the gender perspective becomes a tool for the <laughs> of countries? So, uh, Senator Heine, would you like to start? Um. Okay, I think I'll um, respond uh, primarily to the uh, question on uh, inclusion of uh, disabled uh, uh, community and um, and the uh, is it the elderly? What, the elderly. The yes. yes. Yeah, I think um, you know the the two groups are uh, very much uh, similar to the situation of women, and uh, uh, when we think and when we discuss vulnerable uh, members of our community, definitely those, uh, those two groups are, um, are part of the, and should be part of the conversation. I think uh, uh, in this case, uh, we focus on women, but similar issues and similar considerations that we have should be extended to the, um, the disabled community and, and also to the elderly. There are some, uh, exception in terms of uh, the kinds of support that they need. And I think one of the uh, comments mentioned there is that uh, even in uh, our uh, panel, we do not have uh, um, somebody to translate what we're saying to the disabled community, to the blind and uh, deaf community. So these are the things that we need to, to do better at and remember uh, that we have those uh, vulnerable people that needs to also hear and also share in the conversation uh, as we go forward. So um, uh, I, I'm going to stop there, but I, I, I'm uh, wanting to say that we need to um, do better at addressing the needs of these uh, groups. For the elderly, though, um, there are so many, so much more that they can do. Uh, even uh, as they retire from their uh, formal jobs, there are opportunities that should be created for them to con continue to contribute to the community. Many of the elderly come with, um, of course, knowledge of the culture and traditions and can pass on those information by uh, assisting in schools. And we just need to find ways that we can utilize the, uh, the elderly to, uh, to make sure that they continue to contribute to the to the development of our countries. Um, I, I believe that um, they, they themselves are um, carriers or uh, they, they store the, the knowledge of our institutions in their, in their own uh, persons. And uh, when we fail to um, 
include them in our um, programs and services, then we're ignoring a, a good uh, portion of our population that, that can help us grow as well. And, um, you know, we talk about learning from history, learning from experiences. Uh, these are the people that come with the history and the experience that, uh, that they've, um, they've had over the years. And it's, uh, it's on their backs that our countries uh, were built. And so understanding where they were and where we are now, uh, going forward and bouncing forward, we need to, to include them and uh, we need to do better. Um, so I, I, I know I, I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. We stand on the shoulders of giants and many of them are still with us. And we need to make sure, as you're saying, that they're fully integrated into what we do. They have much to offer. Um, Minister Charles, would you like to take the question with regards to the concrete actions that can be taken to gain political will and ensure that the gender perspective becomes a tool for the advancement? You've already shared some very concrete actions you've taken. Well, I was about to say that, you know, political will is really, um, you know, how determined are we to get it done? And if anything, I believe that the pandemic has really brought us into focus that we don't have an option. Um, and the, the, the faster the world and leaders across the world recognize <laughs> that getting it done in terms of uh, the change and adjustment in approach from a gender perspective, from a climate change perspective, from the environmental perspective, it's not an option. It's not something that's conditional or an appendage. If you don't do it, the result is going to be an unsustainable um, you know, process. The investment will, will, will not turn the profit that you see. Um, so for me, um, I believe that we actually have a greater opportunity now than we've had before because of the challenges in terms of resetting how leaders see their own operation. Um, because we have, we've recognized how fragile the, the economies and the sectors are. Um, and I think it has also been exposed um, in terms of um, the need for political will that if you don't do it, if you don't make the right decisions, if you're not informed, if you don't understand the gender assessments, if you don't prepare in terms of the intersection and integration between gender and climate strategies, um, that you will have a negative impact um, overall. Um, I believe, as I said, uh, that um, a, another big part of ensuring political will is having the right persons in the right places. Um, and that's why my advisory board, um, I ensured that it's 50-50. Um, and, um, you know, hats off to, to my climate change division director, Una May, and her team. They also advised on that. Um, and the reason why it's important to have the right people in the right places is because we are all, there's a virtue to selfishness. The reality is that we will all protect ourselves, no matter what. Um, and we all have different considerations. And sometimes the, the way we contemplate things, it's not meant to be offensive. It's not meant to isolate. It's not meant to exclude, but that's what you know. So by having leaders and placing people who have different orientations and different perspectives, um, you're going to get a more balanced and reasoned outcome. So I think, um, you know, again, find the opportunity in the, in the challenge that we have faced and continue to face and place the right people in the right places so that they can inherently make this, the types of decisions that reflect the strength um, of a more coordinated and strategic approach. Thank you so much for that, Minister. And Liz, um, Ms. Riley, the question for you is, how have faith-based organizations been engaged thus far in the work 
around resilience and and women's empowerment. Thank you, Tony. And uh, unfortunately, my answer is not as much as they should be. And uh, we we've had um, some conversations with faith based organizations, principally around the area of psychosocial support um, in the aftermath of events. Um, but I, I, I believe this is an area that we need to engage in a lot more as Sedima um, with the regional religious bodies um, for the various denominations. We've had some ad hoc interactions in the past, but there is definitely a space for that structured arrangement. I, I thank the panelists for putting that on the table. And certainly it is something that we can look at from the Sedema Coordinating Unit perspective. Um, and if you don't mind, Tony, I'll just touch very briefly on the question one, okay, with respect to the persons with disabilities and the elderly, because I wanted to give the assurance that within our resilience framework structure, when I speak about social protection for the marginal and the most vulnerable, that we do give specific attention to persons who are differently abled, as well as the elderly, um, they are considered within that vulnerable persons grouping. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been an insightful and really empowering panel for me and I'm sure for many online. I've seen that people were excited to hear what you had to say, were inspired by what you had to say. And the fact that we're saying it in a South-South way, where we are sharing what worked in RMI, sharing what worked in Jamaica, sharing what works across the Caribbean region through the experiences of Sedima. Your time is very much valued. It is 8 p.m. in Barbados, where Ms. Riley and I are, 7 p.m. in Jamaica, and I believe it is now noon in the Marshall Islands. Um, the next day. So we really appreciate your time. I would like to give the floor to the deputy representative of the Fiji multi-country office, Melissa Stutzel, so she can give a few words of thanks before we wrap up. Melissa, over thanks. to you. Thanks, Tony. Tony, um, warm welcome. Uh, greetings to you all from here in the Pacific. Um, Thank you so much for such a wonderful panel discussion. We're really pleased to be joining with um, our Caribbean multi-country office to hold this series of feminist dialogues, um, to really have that opportunity to highlight what's unique and um, the unique challenges and opportunities for small island developing states. Um, so Senator Jaime, Minister Charles and Ms. Riley, thank you so much for making your time available to share your wisdom and experience with us um, and to help us all think about how we can make sure gender equality is mainstreamed in our discussions, um, mainstreamed across our work, um, that we take advantage of the being in small island development states um, to see how we can, as Ms. Raleigh has said, bounce forward together. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Melissa. And I really want to thank the teams of the Fiji multi-country office, as well as the Caribbean multi-country office, Anne Reagan, Sharika Chand, Tara Padmore, Sharon carter Burke, Jawara Wells, for all of the work they did to make sure that this panel came off today. And again, I really do want to thank our panelists and all of the participants who stayed with us for the bulk of the time, knowing that many of you have care responsibilities, family responsibilities, work responsibilities. But these, I, I'm very sure that what is going to come and continue to come from this kind of dialogue is a strengthened coordination, lessons learned, and learning and engagement between the Pacific and the Caribbean. And like Minister Charles, my fingers are crossed that the next dialogue we do perhaps can be in person, where we invite you to the region, or we come and see you in the Pacific. And of course, we'll keep the online section of it, where everyone can join from wherever they are. But it is so lovely to be able to see each other 
in person again, and hopefully that will be soon. Please do stay safe. Thank you so much. There's so many messages in the chat um, of thanks and, and beautiful insights to all of the panelists. And the final comment from Noma Tusan is that this was a fantastic discussion, and I, I second that. Thank you so much, and we will be in touch. Please, everyone, stay safe. And until we meet again, have a wonderful night.